with uh, wealth. It's obviously something to do with wealth and economic development, but it's more interesting than that. And that's why I'm talking to you, because it's also largely to do with geology. And therefore, the question is really what, as geologists, can we do about understanding this situation and indeed hopefully hopefully improving it? The only bit of geology you need to know to understand this is that earthquakes happen when faults move. So faults are when rocks break and slide past each other on surfaces. These are called faults. And in this picture, what you're looking at is just outside Los Angeles. Uh, and what you can see is a river coming out of the background. And here's the river I'll show you in blue. And it stops at that line, which goes across the middle of the photograph. And then it starts again below, but having moved sideways. And that sideways movement of about 10 meters, eight meters, happened in the earthquake in 1857 on the San Andreas Fault, just north of Los Angeles, and it offset that river. So that's what it did. The fault slide, slid sideways about eight meters over a distance of two or 300 kilometers. And it's the vibrations as the rocks slide past each other which cause the shaking, which make the earthquake and make all the trouble. Now, faults can move sideways like that. They can also move up and down. This is the fault which moved in that earthquake in New Zealand in 2016, or part of the fault system. And there, the movement is mostly vertical rather than sideways, but it's still the same effect. Now, what's going on? This is a picture of the Earth as seen by geologists, people like me. And some of you will recognize what that is, you'll recognize it immediately if I put the continents on. So what that is, is a globe showing the plates, some plates with continents on. And it's the plates which are moving around, spherical caps on the surface of the earth. And it's where the plates rub against each other that most of the earthquakes occur in the world. And in the interior of the plates, there's nothing going on because nothing's actually moving relative to anything else. So if we look at a map of earthquakes in the world, and here is a map where each red dot is an earthquake, you can see straight away that in the oceans, the earthquakes follow very narrow belts. And each dot there, each red dot is an earthquake. And we're all trained for like, from children from about the age of five to join the dots. You can't resist doing it. So you join the dots and those are the plate boundaries in the oceans. So those yellow lines define the edges of the major plates. And you can see that away from those edges, there's not much going on in the oceans, it's pretty quiet. Nearly all the earthquakes are on those yellow lines. Okay, and if we now look at the biggest earthquakes since 1900, this is a list of them, and the yellow dots show where they are, all of those 10 biggest earthquakes are on these plate boundaries in the oceans. And they're all in places where the plates are sliding underneath the adjacent land. So on the west coast of South America, the Pacific is sliding underneath the Andes, uh, in Japan, it's the Pacific sliding underneath Japan, in Sumatra and in Indonesia, it's the Indian Ocean sliding underneath the islands of, of Sumatra and in Indonesia. The ones in green are the ones in this century. So you can see this century has already been a busy time for earthquake people. Uh, there's been a lot going on. But the place I want to concentrate on is in this black box, which is the great earthquake belt from the Mediterranean through to China. And if I zoom in on it, you can see here, it's quite a different pattern. That in the oceans, look, look southwest of India, all the dots are on a single line, that's the plate boundary in the Indian Ocean. But in the earthquake belt from the Mediterranean to China, they're not. Uh, each of those red dots is an earthquake, each one is a fault moving. And you can see there are hundreds and thousands of faults all over the place in Asia, all of them able to make big earthquakes. And this is a fundamental difference between the way the continents work and the oceans work. Plate tectonics was, de was discovered and, and defined to describe what happens in the oceans. On the continents, you can't join the dots to make plane boundaries, only a lunatic would try to do that. It's simply the wrong language to look at continents. Now, this is a very important distinction between the two. Um, what it means is that in the oceanic plate boundaries, the boundaries, those yellow lines I drew, are essentially single faults which have to move again and again and again um, in earthquakes. And so they move frequently because they have to take up all the motion between the plates. Whereas here in Asia, what's going on is each, each of those little faults is contributing to it. So each one doesn't have to move that often or that much. And this is a fundamental difference between the two, as we will see. That it also means if you want to actually find out where all these faults are, you've got a much bigger job on the continents than in the oceans. 
Now, one thing to say straight away is that that is not simply that that difference between the continents and oceans is not because of our inability to locate them properly. The errors in the locations of those earthquakes are smaller than the sizes of the dots. Okay, so this is a genuine geological difference between the continents and the oceans. Now, if I go back 300 million years, this is what the southern ocean, the southern continents looked like. They were all joined together to make the great supercontinent Gondwana land, which started to break up in the Jurassic about 160, 70 million years ago. And I want to show you what actually happened. So this map is uh, centered on India, which is the yellow bit there. And India, as you can see, was up against Antarctica to the south, Australia to the east, and Africa and Madagascar to the west. And what I'm going to show you is a series of maps. And the number in the top, which says 160, is millions of years ago. And as I go forward in time, you will see India moving north across this map as it goes towards the north. And all those green bits in front of it will coalesce to make Asia. And then India will bash into it. That's what's been going on. So if you go forward to 120 million years, India and Madagascar have started to break away from Africa and Antarctica. Here at 80 million years ago, India has broken away from Madagascar and it's moving north. Here it is at 60, here it is at 40 million years. Now, as it's been moving north, the ocean in front of it, that blue bit, has been sliding underneath Asia in a subduction zone, just like the Pacific slides underneath Japan today, or like the Pacific slides underneath South America. So there's a cartoon showing India, and in front of it, some ocean which is disappearing as it's sliding underneath Asia. But India itself is a bit of continent. It's sitting on the plate, but its crust is pretty thick. It's about 40 kilometers thick, which is thicker than the normal oceanic crust, which is only about seven kilometers thick. And India is really like that plate wearing a life jacket. And the continental rocks that, that India is made of, that all continents are made of, are much less dense than the oceanic rocks. And because they're less dense, they float, and you cannot shove India back inside the earth like you can do with the ocean, which is in front of India in that cartoon. So when India hits Asia, which it did about, 50, started to hit it about 30, 40 million years ago, Asia crumples up. So there's India, it's collided with Asia. And if we look at it now, it slowed down. It's not like a car crash. Before India reached Asia, it was moving north at about 15 centimeters a year. That's 150 millimeters a year. And now it's slowed down to about 40 millimeters per year. But it's still moving north into Asia. And it's still causing all those earthquakes as Asia crumples up to make thicker crust and the high mountains of Tibet and all those mountains in Central Asia. And the reason those are all moving is because there are faults moving, which are giving you all those earthquakes in red there. But a consequence, as I said already, is that there are more faults on the continents than in the oceans, and each one moves less often than in the oceans. If you're in Japan or on the edge of South America or in the middle of the Indian Ocean there, uh, that fault doing the job has to move frequently. You've, you experience many, many earthquakes, uh, and you, it's not a surprise to you that you're an earthquake country. But the problem with Asia, is because each of those faults contributes a little bit to the job. It doesn't have to move very often. And the previous earthquake in one place might be well beyond uh, local memory, maybe, maybe in thousands of years ago. And that's one of the problems which we'll see. So if we return to Asia and look at the edge there where India has bashed into Asia to make the Himalayas, let's look at a couple of earthquakes there. So here's one in 2005 on the border between Pakistan and India and Kashmir. And out of 170,000 people living in this region, 70,000 were killed. That's a horrendous fraction there of people killed in this earthquake. And if we look to show you some idea of the scale of the destruction, here's a picture looking at a town. This is the before picture of this place. And notice in the front of the picture there, you can see a building in the foreground, some trees next to it. When I show you the after picture, that's all you'll recognize. That's the after picture. This town was completely destroyed uh, in this earthquake. And you see similar pictures from Iran. Here's a, a similar uh, an earthquake in Iran, which did the same sort of thing, which, which essentially wiped out this town completely. There's nothing left standing. Now, one of the puzzles is this, is if I show you this picture here, which is a histogram, and along the x-axis is the size of the earthquakes. 
So the earthquakes go up to the biggest uh, uh, magnitude eights to nines there. And the number of deaths those earthquakes have caused in the last hundred or so years, you can see there are two columns which stand out. One has six at the top, one is two. That's the number of earthquakes in each column. The two magnitude nine earthquakes, which are really very, very big, they were in Sumatra in 2004, Japan in, in 2011, and they killed lots of people, as you can see there, between them about a quarter of a million people, but they nearly all died in the tsunami, not in the earthquake itself. The column based on centered on magnitude eight there was mostly, mostly the deaths in that column are contributed by the Tokyo earthquake in 1923, which killed a lot. But there's some surprises. As I say, the biggest earthquakes, the ones eight to nine, are all on those oceanic plate boundaries, which is what this picture is. They're only the earthquakes on the plate boundaries. And one surprise, for example, is that the San Francisco earthquake is down there. About only, only one, you know, somewhere between one and 3,000 people died in San Francisco, which is a small number, as you can see, compared to these other ones. Now what I'm going to do is add in the earthquakes which are not on those ocean oceanic plate boundaries, but the ones are, which are in the interior of the continent. And you can see a huge number more deaths in smaller earthquakes. So we're talking here about earthquakes between about magnitude six to seven, seven and a half. So really quite a lot smaller than the big ones in the ocean, but they kill many, many more people. As you can see, the individual earthquakes there sometimes kill up to 200,000 people, quarter of a million people, and the biggest of all in, in 1530 in China killed, we think, about 800,000 people. So dwarfing the number of people who die in those earthquakes. So this is a surprise. The most deaths are not in the biggest earthquakes. They're in medium-sized earthquakes, but in the middle of the continents. And you can see this um, here in this picture where we plot the number of deaths of the earthquake in the earthquake along the x-axis versus the cost, how much the earthquake costs. And let me draw your attention to a few things here. So here's an earthquake in 1994, essentially in the suburbs of Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley, and it was about 96.7. It killed 57 people, but a huge cost. Look at the cost of it there, which is in, you know, way up in there, 20, 30 billion dollars. But even that huge cost is a very small amount, even of California's GDP. By contrast, if I highlight the one in Haiti in 2010, which is a uh, similar size, it killed 200,000 people. And it also costs a lot of money, 10 billion people. But two, 10 billion people is 100% of the entire country's GDP. So there's this great imbalance. So all those uh, earthquakes on the right-hand side of that diagram have killed loads of people mostly in the interior of continents in that earthquake belt running through from Mediterranean to China. And you can see that the San Francisco earthquake plots there and the LA future earthquake is a sort of prediction of what will happen the next big earthquake in, in Los Angeles. Yes, there'll be some deaths, probably about a thousand, not that many compared to these other places. It will cost a vast amount of money for sure. That's the thing. And this is behind this real contrast in the world we have today, which is sometimes summarized as the rich pay and the poor die. That's really what it's what, what, what is this contrast. And I want to examine that a little bit more closely, mainly from this geological angle. And I'm going to start by telling you a story of an earthquake here. We looked at that in Iran. This is a map of the Middle East. You recognize the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia. Well, here, I want to draw your attention to a little village called Safida Bay between Iran and Afghanistan. It was right on the border of the two, right in the desert there. And the name Safida Bay turns out to be part of the story. But here's what it looked like. So this was a, a village in the middle of the desert, an extremely remote place. The earthquake was not very big. It was about magnitude six, but it completely destroyed this place, killed a couple of hundred people, completely wiped out this village. And the interesting thing about this was that this village was the only habitation for 100 miles in any direction. It was an extremely remote place. And uh, give you some idea of how remote. To the east is the Dash Jumaga in Afghanistan. The Dash Jumaga means the desert of death. That's what it looks like. To the west, the Dash Jalut, the great salt desert in Iran. Um, here is, is the Dash Jalut means the desert of hell. So here is this village between the desert of death, the desert of hell, in the middle of nowhere, and the earthquake hit it very precisely just there. And you think, wait a minute, what is going on? Is this the, is this just bad luck? Um, is it the earth being extremely vindictive, or is there more to this story? So here we are looking at Safida Bay again, and behind it, 
you can see a ridge, which is about 70 meters high. Here are a couple of people on it to give you some idea of the scale. Now, the reason that ridge is there is because what happened in this earthquake, if in a cartoon, is this. It's what's called a thrust fault, where one side is pushed on top of the other side here. But those arrows showing one side moving on top of the other side, they get smaller towards the surface because the fault never actually made it to the surface. It died out at the surface. And the best analogy I can give you is if you have a telephone directory and you try and push the top over the bottom of the telephone directory, because of the binding of the book, it will turn into a fault. And that's what happens here. And that's the origin of that ridge next to the village is because although the fault moves at depth, it dies out towards the surface like the binding of the book. It turns into a fold, which is that ridge. And here is a cartoon showing what's happened. In that particular earthquake, the fault moved only a meter or so, uplifted the ridge about a meter, and the village is built next to the ridge, as you can see in the cartoon. Now, in the past, what used to happen is a river flowed through the line of that fold and it generated a fan, and the fan is the village, the the, where the village was built. But as that ridge has grown over time with, with, with progressive earthquakes, it gets uplifted more and more. The river had to cut down into a canyon. It eventually became dammed, it blocked, it made a lake, temporary lake which evaporated. And then finally the river just gave up and it said, okay, I'm going to go around the end instead. And it got diverted where it shows in blue round the end of that fold. Now you can see all that in the landscape. And I want to show you next, this is a satellite image and it shows the cartoon and on the right is a satellite image. Don't worry about the colors because it's infrared and I'll draw your attention to various things. The red dot shows where the village is located and you can see a road from the north to south, that line going through the village, that gives you an idea of the scale. And where it says Sefida Bay in white letters, you can see a whole load of streams and the streams all radiating out from that gap in the ridge where there's a the red the black rocks and there's a gap next to the village they all radiated out through there because what used to happen was this river came through that gap to make that fan with all those radiating streams it then got blocked in the white area marked l is the lake sediments where the um, lake deposited sediments when it was dammed and eventually the river gave up and now the river goes around the end out there and I want to show you what it actually looks like on the ground. So I'm going to show you a photograph taken where the red arrow is looking across that gap. And here's what it looks like. There's some people on the right for scale. And in the foreground, you have the black rocks of the south. In the north, you have the black rocks of the northern part of the ridge. And in between, you can see the village on the right. You can see the horizontal white lake beds which have been uplifted because that's these are the lake beds here, because this is where the river came through. So the river used to come through there and it got blocked and eventually gave up. But since that time, the lake, which was in the desert level, has been uplifted about 70 meters. So that's what happened. Now I want to show you the view from the road of the village looking back at that gap where the river used to come out. And here you are looking at it and you can see straight away those are the white lake beds lifted up behind the ridge about 70 meters. You can see the black rocks on the south, which are on the left. The black rocks in the north which are on the right there and it's quite clear what's going on. Now here's the secret. The secret is the white lake beds are actually an aquifer. They're sediments so they can pond water and as the lake beds have been uplifted in progressive earthquakes the water leaks out and here is a spring and we're up here up against these um, white lake beds where the spring comes out of the rock and there it is flowing towards the the village and that is why the village is there. They're there because the spring is the only source of water in the desert and that's why I said the name is a clue. Sefida Bay in Persian means white water. So here's the deal, you have to live there because that's the only place there's any water in the desert and what makes the water possible is the fact that the fault is there which is uplifting this aquifer and causing it to leak and so the fault is what makes life possible in the desert in this place. The downside is that when the fault moves, you get killed. But that is actually what is going on. We can do a bit more than that. Here are the uplifted lake sediments, and you can see the village down on the bottom there. And we can find out how old they are. We can have ways of dating them. They're 100,000 years old. And what that's telling us when we look at this is that lake has been uplifted 70 meters in 100,000 years. Each earthquake uplifts it about a, uh, a meter or so. So we need about 100 earthquakes to do that. 
Uh, and so we need an earthquake about every thousand years to do that. So that's how often we're expecting an earthquake. That's all you need to do that. And during that time, the river has pushed, been pushed five kilometers in that direction. So in a hundred thousand years, so every time there's an earthquake, what happens is the ridge grows a little bit. It grows an extra 50 meters longer. And that's what has in the end caused the, the ridge to elongate like that so that the river goes around the end of it. So what I've described is really how all the clues to what's going on are in the landscape if you can read the clues. So what you have to do is to learn how to read all those clues in the landscape. And now we can do it and it's obvious what's going on. Of course, before the earthquake, no one had done it. We didn't really know how to do it, but we've, we've now seen this in lots of places. And now we can go around and actually see places which are in principle vulnerable because the landscape is telling you what has happened before. And there's more to this again. If we go here, and this is in a similar place where we're looking at a fault, there's a village next to the fault of the same reason. And what you see in the plain next to the fault is a whole string of what look like craters, like craters going away from the fault. And the cartoon underneath shows you what's going on. What's going on is that the people have dug tunnels from the village back to the fault, because on the, on the mountain side of the fault, the water table is higher than on the valley side. The reason it's higher is because as the fault moves and the rocks grind past each other, they get broken down to make a very fine clay, which is impermeable, and that acts like an under, underground dam holding up the water table. So the water table is higher next to the mountain. You dig a tunnel in there, and the water will flow to the village. And the vertical shafts, which are the craters, are just so you have access to the tunnel, so you can scoop out the sediment and breathe and all that kind of stuff. So here's what the, the, those craters look like. Here's some people and, uh, with a hole, and there's an ancient windlass and a, a man lifting up buckets of earth and so on as they, uh, in this case, they're maintaining it because these things silt up a bit. Here we are looking down that hole, which can be tens of meters deep. And by the time you get down to the bottom, here's what it looks like. We're looking along one of these things. They're called canats. They're underground tunnels and the light is coming down from the vertical shafts above. And that's a dry one. But what they, when they're functioning, here it is producing beautiful, cool water in the village away out of the desert. Some of these things are tens of kilometers long. They may be up to 100 meters deep. So these are wonderful feats of engineering. And what they are responsible for in Iran is these fabulous Oh, desert oases. So on the left, there's one famous one in the middle of the desert in central Iran, which is a sort of fantasy garden. It has fountains, ducks, water, ponds, palaces, trees, all sorts of wonderful lush vegetation in the middle of this scorching desert, fed by one of these Kanat tunnels going back to a fault. And on the right, a famous one at Tabasi Golshan, that means Tabas, the flower garden. This was another oasis fed with water in the same way, visited by Marco Polo in the 13th century. And when Marco Polo went through, it was very flourishing and it was destroyed in 1978 in an earthquake. Here it is, uh, is what it looked like after the earthquake. Out of 13,000 people who lived in this place, 11,000 were killed outright, 85% mortality. It's a really shocking thing. And why, when we look at the geology, here it is, Tabas again, you can see the greenery there. This was the only settlement for more than 100 kilometers in any direction. It's right next to the mountains. Again, it's next to these blind faults, which make folds at the surface. The edges of the folds are shown here in the red lines. And as the fold gets pushed up in the air, you can see these rivers have to cut down to make deep canyons. The canyons end at the fold. And for centuries, Tabas has got its water by digging these canats, these tunnels back into the fold to tap the source of water, which is what makes life possible there. Now, the problem is that these little places like Safida Bay and Tabas eventually become big places. So here's the capital, Tehran of Iran, right up against the mountain, as you can see. It's got a population now of 10 to 12 million people. And it's been destroyed in earthquakes four times since the coming of Islam to Iran in the, the, the dates. But in those days, it was really a rather minor place, a stopover on a trade route. And the number of people who died were not very great. But now it's the capital city with 12 million people. So let's have a look at it. This is a, a satellite view draped over the topography. It's all, it's about the size of London. That is all urban now. And when you look at it, what strikes you in the middle of that picture, you can see a couple of rivers coming out of the mountain and they're cutting down in these canyons, just like they were at Tabas 
and Sapida Bay, and they end along a line, which is a ridge, and that ridge is a fold. There's the fold, it's exactly like we've seen before, and it shows where the faults are. So there's one fault there in the middle, the Pakistan Fault, and one along the edges of the mountains there, the North Tehran Fault. I want to zoom in on this one in the middle, because here it is, and that's, there it is close up, because that is a fold, it's a ridge in the middle of the city, and about 20 years ago, Tehran decided it wanted some iconic monument to put it on the map, rather like the Eiffel Tower. So they built this great big tower, where? On that ridge, because it's about 100 meters high, you get a bit of extra elevation for nothing. And so they built it there, completely unaware that that's what it was. It was there because there's a fault right next to it. And even more tragically, they built a new big hospital for Tehran right next door. So there it is. These two places, buildings are in the worst possible place you can be, right on the fault where it daylights at the surface. That's where the ground motions are greatest. If we look at the mountain front now, this is the mountain, the North Tehran Fault, and on the edge of the mountain there, that development has all been recent. So in the past, Tehran was in the southern part of this picture. If I show you what it looks like along the edge of the mountain front, there is the mountain front. The mountain is there because the fault comes to the surface. You can see the development creeping up to it. But the break of slope between the mountain front and the, and the desert plain is that red line. That is where the Tehran Fault comes to the surface. And that picture was taken in 2013. When we returned only four years later, here they are, building buildings right on top of it here. So the development of the city is not in pace with the geological understanding. So the thing is just developing at a crazy rate without any real regard to what we now understand about the hazards in this place. So why is it there? Tehran is there because until about the 1930s, it was in the southern part of this picture and all its water came from canats, these tunnels, tapping the water in that fold, which is an active fault. And all that has been forgotten. The people who dug these canats, these tunnels, are immensely skilled. Uh, it's, a, it's an ethnic group called Moganis. This is what they do. They go around digging these things. They know perfectly well that's how to find the water. But this knowledge has not really been passed on. It's been forgotten. And now, of course, with, with the great metropolitan development, those canats have long since had all the water pumped out of them. They've been dry. And the water of Tehran now comes from reservoirs in the mountains. So you could say, well, if you understand all this thing, why do you live there? Why not go somewhere else? And you can't go somewhere else because this is what somewhere else looks like in Iran. The central part of the desert is just salt flats. There's no water. There's no possibility of agriculture with all the salt. You have to live where the water supply is. You have to live on the edge of the mountains. That's where agriculture is possible. That's where all the strategic access is controlled on the trade routes and so on. And if I show you a map now of the the earthquakes in that mountain belt region again, the black lines are the main trade routes, which for centuries have passed through this area. This is what we know as the Silk Road. And if I take away the earthquakes, you can see those trade routes follow the edges of the mountains and the deserts and the high plateaus like Tibet. Um, and that's where everybody lives, right? But the edges of those features, the plateaus, the deserts, the, uh, and so on, the mountains, are created by those same faults which move in earthquakes. And so if you now look in the last thousand years, these are, this is a map of the earthquakes which have killed more than 10,000 people, in yellow, more than 100,000 people. They are mostly in towns and cities along those trade routes. That is why they are where they are. Now, Tehran is not on there because actually those old earthquakes in Tehran didn't kill 10,000 people because it wasn't very important. But still, since that time, a lot of places have grown up along the trade routes, which are now mega cities of many millions of people. So in the past, a lot of those earthquakes, which would have killed just a few thousand, you're now talking about, you know, typically in Iran, 30% of the population are killed, but you're talking about mega cities. And if I just show you the reality of that, so here is Tehran, the capital of Iran, just destroyed four times, as I've already mentioned. Here is Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan, destroyed three times, again on the edge of the mountains in the, in the last 130 years or so. Kathmandu and Nepal destroyed many, many times. And that's true of all the capital cities in Asia, uh, in that part of Central Asia. So you look at the capital of, of um, Uzbekistan, Tashkent, that was destroyed in the 1960s. The capital of Turkmenistan, Ashgabat, was destroyed in 1948, killing about 100,000 people and so on. What's happened is the populations have concentrated in the most dangerous places. And that is the problem we are having to deal with. So how do we deal with this? And why, is, why, why are these places around the oceanic 
rims, Japan, Chile, New Zealand, California, so much more resilient. What you need to do firstly is identify the hazard. What is it you're up against? Where are the faults? How much do they move? How frequently do they move? What are the size of earthquakes you're gonna get? What sort of earthquake? All that sort of geological stuff, which I've been talking about, you have to put in that work. That is the job of earth scientists, people like us. You then have to talk to the engineers, architects, planners to say, okay, this is what you're up against. Can you design stuff which is safe and prepare for it, uh, well, that it'll be okay? And the answer is generally yes, these people are very clever, but they do need to know what it is they've got to prepare for. You then need to have a three-way conversation with the civic leaders, the public, administrators, politicians, educators, to say, okay, here's the reality. Will you actually prioritize some sort of risk reduction here uh, so, to make people less vulnerable? Because what we've been talking about is the geology, but what actually matters here is the consequences of these events in terms of the infrastructure, the population and so on. That's what we mean by risk. And we distinguish here between risk and hazard. You can't do anything about the hazard. The hazard is what the earth is going to throw at you. And we can understand it, but we can't actually stop it. What we can do is something about the consequences of that. And that's what we get swept up in this term risk. So what did we, about 10 years ago, uh, we thought, let's, what can we do as geologists and earth scientists, seismologists about this? What can we actually do? And this is where this project, Earthquakes Without Frontiers, came from. So here we are in BAM, and the picture, person in that picture is an Iranian colleague who's actually a student of mine who had done his PhD here and then went back to Iran, a uh, senior figure in the geological survey, very good seismologist, knew what's going on. And we thought, okay, what can we actually do? And we thought what we need to do is three things. One is we need to better knowledge of what the hazards are in these places. We need to actually put in the work. And the work has been put in in places like California, Japan, Chile, New Zealand for 100, of, 100 years or so. People have worked hard on that. And really in most of Central Asia, they're at first base. They haven't really done this kind of work. We need to actually think, okay, if you know about that, if you know what the hazards are, what, are, what is the way of actually translating that knowledge into making a more resilient uh, infrastructure and population? And you need to increase the local capability. I'm showing you that picture because when we took it in 2003, after the BAM earthquake, that man in the picture was one of really a handful of people in Iran who really had a modern understanding of earthquake science. And you need to have more of them in these places. So actually uh, educating, training, bringing people and swapping people around was part of this vision. And so what we did was say, OK, if we look at these countries in Asia and here are the ones which were involved, these are all countries we had had contact in for in some places like Iran, 20, 30 years. So we knew well the people, the scientists in these countries, a lot of them had been trained in Europe or America or indeed in Britain uh, with us. We had good working relations with these people. These were generally the people who had to talk to their civic leaders and governments and so on about the earthquake hazard in their countries. And how could we help them? We could help them by actually forming a sort of partnership where people could talk to each other exchange their knowledge, training, students, um, and, and help each other with how to actually talk to the people in their country who were responsible, responsible for public safety. That was the vision we had. And let me give you some idea of how, how this went ahead. As I say, the first thing was to put in the work to do the science. So if I return to Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan, here it is on a map, the inset shows where we're talking about. Almaty was destroyed three times in historic times. The first time in 1887. And it turns out when you put in the work, the earthquake wasn't in Almaty. It was about 50 kilometers to the west along the mountain front where I put it there. And the reason it's just talked about as the Almaty earthquake is at that time, Almaty was the only settlement of any size in the whole place. So of course, it's called the Almaty earthquake. The next earthquake in 1889, Almaty was destroyed again, but the earthquake was a long way away, way over here on the right-hand edge of that map, um, about 100 kilometers away on a separate fault altogether, that black line there, which we found recently. We know where it is. And we found it with colleagues from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. The, it was destroyed a third time in 1910, and the earthquake which did it wasn't in Almaty again. It was the other side of the mountain belt in a different country now, in Kyrgyzstan, where it says 1910 there. And again, that fault is now well understood. We know where it is. 
And every time it was described as the Almaty earthquake, because Almaty was the only place anyone had heard about, but it wasn't there. And there's some pretty misleading information. So these are pictures of Almaty in 1911 after the earthquake. And those are cracks in the ground. People said, OK, that's the that's the Almaty. Those are the faults which did it. Those are not the faults which did it. That is frozen ground, essentially frozen soil, because it was a, in winter, which cracked as a result of the shaking. And the fault which did it is here. This is the other side of the mountains from Almaty. And you can see a little scarp there, eight meters high. That's what moved in this earthquake, which is in a different country altogether in Kyrgyzstan. If we zoom in, here's what it looks like. You can see a field, which is a slope, and it up, is uplifted there along that white line. It's eight meters higher on the left-hand side. That was once a continuous slope. And if we look along the fault, here it is. And you can see if I zoom in on that mountainside here, you can see Two things. You can see a white escarpment. That is the bit which moved in 1911. And next to it is a higher one which moved in earlier earthquakes. So again, if you can read the language in the landscape, you can see, OK, this is a fault which is moving. It's moved in the past. Our job is to find when it last moved, how frequently it moves, how much it moves, how big the earthquake it's going to make is likely to be. And we did a lot of this work. And here are some colleagues from Nepal and Kyrgyzstan looking at that together, sharing this kind of knowledge in this partnership. We could take them all around. The guy in the middle from Kyrgyzstan is an extremely distinguished, knowledgeable guy, showing the people in Nepal, OK, this is what we can see here. This is what we're up against. And if you know what's happened, what happened in these earthquakes, you can go back and say, OK, what would happen if these earthquakes happened again in Almaty? And you can work out the, the figure here for these three different earthquakes is what you would predict the peak ground acceleration to be as a fraction of G. So 27% here up to 57% here. And you can see that the, 57, the, the 1887 earthquake, although it was smaller, magnitude seven instead of eight, has a higher ground acceleration in Almaty because it's closer to it. And that's what matters most, it turns out, for this particular thing. So you can do the sort of work which you can then go and share with engineers and say, OK, Almaty is likely to get this kind of level of ground shaking from earthquakes in the future on these faults. Will your buildings be resilient? What can you do about strengthening them and so on? So that's one of the things you could do. So that's was some sort of surprise, if you like. And here, if we go to Nepal and look at that, we know perfectly well what's happening in Nepal. What's going on there is that India is sliding underneath Tibet and the Himalayas. So here's India, and it's moving underneath like that. And as it moves, it rubs. And that is the fault there, which is pushing one over the other. That is the fault which moves in the big earthquakes in the Himalayas. And if I show, I think I can show you here, I hope, a little, okay, the fault goes down to about 20 kilometers. Below that, the rocks are hot enough for it just to be sliding freely by creep. And I hope I can show you a video. The bit which is says locked there is stuck and it jerks in earthquakes. So what actually happens in the video is this. You'll see that when it moves and the fault is stuck, that doesn't stop India moving north. As I say, India is moving north at 40 millimeters per year and the whole of the Himalayas gets squashed. And you'll see it in this little animation, getting squashed, squashed, squashed until it can't get squashed anymore. And then it rebounds. And it's the rebounding which makes the earthquake. So let's see if I can, this works. Um, if I can play, play this little animation. Here it is. I hope you can see the whole thing being squashed. And then it rebounds when the earthquake happens. So if I do that one more time, let's see if that works. Yeah. There it is as India moves through. The locked part is getting squashed. And then it re rebounds. And that's what actually happened in the earthquake. OK, so that is where the earthquake is. What's, what, what's in that picture? is all the previous earthquakes we know about, the really big ones along the front of the Himalaya. And the 2015 one in Nepal is highlighted there. It's right between one which was in 1934 and one which is a much bigger one in 1505. And so that this is the, the mountain front which breaks repeatedly in big earthquakes and it shows you where some of them are. And it shows you the huge population in the Ganges Valley there in front of it all. Now, if we look at Kathmandu, here is Kathmandu. This was the place which was shaken up by that last earthquake. And what actually happened is that here, here's is, is the, the cartoon is in white, where the fault projects to the surface is where that white line is with the, the teeth on it. And colored in there is the bit of the fault which actually moved. 
in this earthquake in 2015. And what actually happened is it started here, that's the epicenter, and it ruptured to the southeast like that for a distance of about 100 kilometers. It took about a minute to do that, minute and a half. And in red is the part of the fault which moved up to about four meters. What you can see is that it didn't move all the way to the white line in the south. It ruptured between about 20 kilometers depth and 10 kilometers depth. It didn't break all the way to the surface, which was a surprise. How do we know that? Because we have a lot of information now from seismology, from GPS, from space-based radar and so on. I won't tell you about the details, but we know that's what happened. But there's another effect, which is very important. If we look at Kathmandu, Kathmandu is built on an old lake basin. And here we are at the map of Kathmandu, and on the north, where it says KKN4, that was one seismic station with the GPS as well, and in the southern NSAST. The one AS, NAST is in the lake basin, the one in the north is on red, bedrock, and the two the pictures there show the ground motion. And what you can see for KKN4, doesn't matter whether you look at the north, north, south, east, west, or up and down, you can see a sudden movement, which doesn't last very long. What you see on the right-hand one, NAST, is a resonance. You can see it going wobbling along for about 20 or more seconds. And that is because the lake bed wobbles like jelly, whereas the, the, hard, the, the, the hard rocks in the north at KKN4 just shake very briefly, but for very, very quickly, but it doesn't last long. And I can show you that when I replay the ground motion at these two places. So what we're looking at is the movement north, north-south on the x-axis, y-axis, east-west on the east on the x-axis, and they're the two places. And you can see in yellow is the one on the lake basin, and blue is the one on the rock. And when I start this, you'll see they'll both move. And they move initially to the southeast, and then they move to the west. And the, the, you'll see that the blue one moves very fast. That's on the hard rock. The yellow one moves slower because it's in the softer lake sediments, but it then wobbles about as it resonates for a much longer time. So let's just play that. I hope. Is he not going to do it? What a shame. It's frozen. What's happened? Oh, here it is. Yes, it's starting to. So here it is. And it's about to move. There you can see them wobbling around before the earthquake starts. And when the earthquake starts, there's a blue one going quickly. And here's the yellow one wobbling for longer. Now, one way of showing you that, which really is quite interesting, is I'm going to show you the same thing again, but with a video attached to it in, in synchronized time. So the video, which you can see there, is looking at a marketplace in Kathmandu, and you'll see the motion of that point on the ground, which is on the lake bed, you'll see it. And as it wobbles backwards and forwards in real time, this is the last one was speeded up in real time, you'll see that the people respond to it. So now I'm going to have to stop this share, share a different screen, and we're going to play this video before it works. You see, you'll see a video, here it's coming up. And now when I play this, you'll see exactly the same thing. You'll see the GPS motion, but you'll see the people respond to it now on the left in that, in that security camera. So here's the earthquake starting, people running out of the house, and then it moves to the west and they all move to the west. And then it wobbles and it moves to the east and they all move to the east and then to the west. And what they're doing is responding to the wobbling jelly, the resonance of the lake basin. And that's what, what's going on there. OK, so this is quite a nice demonstration of what we mean by that resonance. So we stop that show and go back to, I hope, this. Let's see if I can pick it up. This would be a miracle if it works straight off with where we were. I need to come back to where we were, which is here. Oh, great. Amazing. It works. OK, so what did that resonance do? That resonance, it's like any musical instrument. If it's resonating at a particular frequency, it will it will it will affect it will respond or, or buildings will respond to it, which respond to that frequency. So just like a bassoon responds to a deeper note than a piccolo, what this resonance did, the slow resonance of the lake basin brought down this tall tower as you can see, but in the background, you can see it didn't bring down the other buildings which are smaller because they have a higher resonant period. Now that's the kind of thing we can work out and predict before the earthquakes happen. So 
this was rather an important bit of, if you like, value added from the science. We understood the resonance. We understood that the earthquake only moved the lower part of this fault. That's really important. When you look at this cartoon cutaway, what it shows is the shape of the fault as India slides underneath Nepal. And it really has to move all of it from the bottom right up to the surface. That's what it did in 1934, but what it didn't do in 2015, it only eruptured the bottom bit. And so we could say with some confidence, that look, it's still got to finish the job sometime. It's still got to move that shallower part. We don't know when, it could be today, tomorrow, 10 years time, 100 years time, but it's got to happen sometime. And that's a bit which is really right underneath Kathmandu to the Indian border. And it's also going to actually affect what's next door. So next door, which last moved in 1505, will be now brought closer to failure because of the earthquake in 2015. This is not a sophisticated argument. It's like when you have a, a crack in the windscreen of your car, you know where it's going to go next. It's going to move along, right? Because that's where the stress is concentrated. That's what's happening here. And so the important thing we could say is that it's not over yet. But this is a wake up call for Kathmandu. The reason 10,000 people died, not 100,000, is because the earthquake did, only did half the job. Now, OK, that gives you some idea of what we could do in this partnership. We could put together this work to find out what happened in the science. The problem is, if you actually now go and talk to the people responsible for public safety about this, uh, and here's what the problem is. This is, for example, looking at here's Delhi at midday. Right? It's a disgrace. The, 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 the air quality is so awful you can hardly see. And you talk to people and they say, OK, every day we have to cope with these problems. Right? It may take us two hours to drive to work or to school. We have problems with pollution, traffic, congestion, air quality, blah, 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 all these things. And you say the last earthquake, when was the last earthquake? A couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> Forget it. Every day we have to deal with these other things. Earthquakes have a very low priority. And almost inevitably, if someone actually gets it, that, that nonetheless, when a big earthquake happens, it sort of wipes everything out, they say, well, they hope that's some sort of scientific problem which you will solve. What they mean by that is they hope one day the scientists will say, OK, it's going to be Wednesday at two o'clock, right? that you will predict it. And that is something we cannot do. So short term earthquake prediction is not the answer to this. This is a famous quote from Charles Richter when he retired. He's of the Richter magnitude scale saying, and you can read it, he fought a losing battle to keep away from the uh, notion of earthquake prediction. The press and public go towards the suggestion of prediction like hogs to the trough. Meanwhile, other objects are, are neglected and so on, and aid is given to people who would like to forget that for public safety, you don't need prediction. You need proper building construction and regulation. And this was brought home very clearly in the earthquake in 2009 in L'Aquila in central Italy, killed about 300 people. And the local population were really angry with the seismologists in Italy for not predicting it, right? And the seismologists were brought to trial. Uh, it was a great palaver, which lasted about five years. Initially, they were being sent to jail, fined a million euros, barred from holding any public office and so on, in spite of the fact that every earth scientist in the world knows you cannot predict in the short term earthquakes. What you can do is say, where have there been earthquakes? They'll have earthquakes in the future. And this was the map of earthquake hazard now in Italy before that earthquake happened. And the earthquake L'Aquila was right in the middle of that purple region, the place where the ground shaking was predicted to be highest of any place in Italy, where there have been many, many earthquakes in the past. And they were not able to say when the next earthquake was going to be, but they were able to say, look, you live in the most dangerous place in Italy. You had better make sure that your buildings are OK. But because the public had been allowed to expect that it was somehow the job of scientists and so on to predict earthquakes, they got really cross. And this was a typical quote from a man who tragically lost his family. But the bottom line is that they were they felt that the scientists had let them down and we can't do that. And this is one of the most important messages we had to put out in our partnership was what we couldn't do as well as what we could do. And you have to educate the public and politicians and people saying that short term earthquake prediction is firstly impossible. And secondly, if you allow it to be linked to public safety, it kills people because then people don't do what they should do to make themselves better protected and safer. This was really brought home in China. In 2008, there's a big earthquake in Sichuan in China, which killed 80,000 people. And until that time, the Chinese officially uh, were basing their earthquake mitigation 
policies, the public health policy of, on safety was based on some long-term idea that sooner or later they would crack this earthquake prediction problem. And it can't be done. And they had the bigness to say after that earthquake, they said that, that policy killed 80,000 people. And so they no longer do that. Public safety policy in China is now linked not to prediction, it's linked to mitigation, public education, building better buildings, preparation in advance and so on. And one of the things we did in this partnership was a lot of this. So here we are sitting around and what we would do is meet, bring a, an international group to this, in this case, it's in Nepal, and we would not really speak. We would be helping our Nepalese colleagues uh, in, in earth science, talking to the Nepalese politicians and administrators, government people, and we would be there to back it, back them up, because our Nepalese colleagues knew perfectly well what was going on. They were describing it to their politicians and having and being able to show that they, the Nepalese scientists, were in touch with the international community. What they were saying to their local administrators and government was not some exotic local view of what was going on. It was the international accepted consensus on what the situation was. And that firstly reassured the local governments and politicians that their scientists knew what they were talking about. And secondly, look, took any sort of suggestion out of it of, of foreigners coming and preaching us that they know what's going on and we don't know what's going on. There was none of that at all. This was very successful. And an odd feature of this partnership was actually going to meetings. We did it in China, in Nepal, in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran going to these meetings and really not opening our mouths until the Nepalese wanted to say, actually, prediction is not the answer. Here are our friends from China and our friends from Italy telling you what will happen. If you allow the public to be um, to, to think that actually prediction is going to be the answer, you will get into this kind of trouble, right? which the Chinese and the Italians did. So it was a very constructive thing in that in that sense. There were other things we could do. I'm coming to the end of uh, just be a, a couple of minutes now. One of the things we, what the Nepalese did in, in Nepal, which is very, very good, they're sort of really first class Nepalese engineering NGO, is they put together a storybook. They were saying the so called earthquake uh, scenario for Kathmandu. They were saying, okay, let's look at that 1933 earthquake, the last time there was a big one there. What actually happened? What would happen today if it was repeated? And what would happen today was put together as a storybook. And it was put together as a story of what would happen to a family when the earthquake happened. And it was saying, okay, this is what would happen in the earthquake today. For example, the, far, the, 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 the man might be working the other side of the, of the city. There's a river going through the middle. The bridges would have fallen down across the river. It might take him two days to get back. Meanwhile, what does the family do? The family camps on the local football fields and so on. And after three days, everyone's cross about there's no water supply and so on and so on and so on. And this was put together as a story because people could read it and then identify with it. Now, what it wasn't, was some arm waving exercise. What it was is a result of about two years of hard work by the scientists, looking at what had happened in 1933, looking at how the infrastructure had changed since 19, 1933, where the population densities had changed, where the building quality had changed, where the concentrations of lifelines were, like electricity, water supply, communications, all this kind of stuff. Well, what, a lot of serious work goes into that. And then when the earthquake happened in 2013, you could take this book and more or less turn over the page and say, OK, this is what's going to happen today. And indeed, it did happen. That is what the situation was. And it was extremely interesting and it had a big effect on our Chinese colleagues who then asked to do the same thing in China. So a similar thing was put forward to China here, uh, looking at a city in China, saying what happened in repeat of one of their earthquakes. And in China, the way to communicate this was as a cartoon book. What would actually happen to this particular family? And it was put together in two versions. One was a cartoon book as a story for the public. And on the right was uh, a second version with more technical information for the engineers, planners, architects who actually had to deal with this kind of thing. So a typical one would be, for example, that the telephone network goes down, not because mobile telephone networks go down, they're actually very resilient, but because they get overloaded. Everyone's trying to find, phone home to find out if their friends and family are okay. And so it gets saturated and you can't use it. And then indeed the emergency services can't use it. And there are ways around that by having priority number systems and this kind of thing that you could put together this kind of story. So this is just an example of the kind of things 
you can do as scientists. And this was a partnership in this case between the, the Chinese and our Nepalese partners who'd, who'd shown the way to do this and our friends from, from other countries who all joined in and doing this work. A lot of scientific work went into this. So you look at some place like Iran again, here's Tabriz, the former Mongol uh, capital of Iran, destroyed in 1721 and 1786. Each of these earthquakes killed about a quarter of a million people. And here is Tabriz today, which is a giant building site. And at one level, you think this is completely out of control. No one's taking any notice. And is it completely hopeless? Because the priority is just not there for earthquakes. It's the priority of, of the, the reality of living in a city like this in Asia is all to do with things like pollution, congestion, traffic, water quality, air quality, food quality, communications, all that kind of stuff, poverty. Um, and yet, there's some surprises. So there was a really big earthquake in 2017 in Western Iran. And here it was in this town it, of a population of about 30,000 people. It was a really big earthquake, 7.4, biggest earthquake for the last 40 years in Iran. And it killed 600 people. Now that's a tragedy, but look at those buildings. They have stood up, right? Where previously a typical collapse of buildings in Iran would kill 30% of the population. <clears throat> These buildings are shattered. They're absolutely no use. But they stayed up and they did not collapse. And these are steel concrete frame buildings. Uh, and they were actually pretty OK. Here's what they look like afterwards. I mean, they're a complete write off. But the important thing is they didn't kill people. And this is actually really a sign of progress. This was and so it looks like a terrible disaster. This was really uplifting for our Iranian colleagues who are thinking finally, 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 there are building regulations, there are codes, and people are starting to take some sort of notice of them. And this is, an, I'll end up with my last line and last story is really a quite an interesting one because your tendency is to look at some place like Tehran and say it's completely hopeless. We've got all these old buildings which are already no good. We know they'll fall down. Uh, what can we possibly do? And the lesson is to go back to the 1933 earthquake in Long Beach in California. Long Beach is the harbor for Los Angeles. There was an earthquake happened on a, on a weekend at night and, and it scared people because a lot of unreinforced masonry buildings fell down, especially schools. And that's when they introduced building codes. And the, uh, the building codes in California came in at that time. And the local people, the local administration had to make a serious decision. They said, well, okay, we can make building codes, but what do we do about the buildings we've already got, which are dangerous and not much good? And what do we do about that? And they made the strategic decision not to do anything about those. There's nothing you can do about those, but every time you make a new building or you reinforce an old building or you modify it, you extend it, you do anything, uh, redevelop it, you have to follow those new building codes. And that's what they did. And here's the interesting thing, about 1980, 1890, the, the local administration went back and they thought, well, what have we got? Let's have a look at our old unreinforced buildings. And they found out there weren't any. That the development of the city itself, the development of the real estate, meant that every that, that three-story buildings were knocked down to build five-story buildings, but the new buildings had to follow these new building codes. The few buildings which are important for heritage and history and so on um, had been retrofitted and strengthened. You have the money to do that, but in general, the development of the city itself was the engine for making it more um, more resilient, and that was very very important. And this is a, a quote from the person in charge of that policy now saying this is what you have to do that is that it, it's never a great political win but you just have to get on with it and, and and make sure you implement the building codes and do it now and this turned out to be a very inspiring message for our colleagues in Iran the message they're giving now to the mayor of Tehran and the other public administrators is saying look you're building 10,000 new buildings every year in Tehran so start now and every year you have 10,000 more buildings that are going to be safe instead of worrying about the ones which are not going to be safe that is something you can do and that's why you should do it now so I've gone on too long I'm sorry I'll stop there I'll stop the share and I'm very happy to talk to anyone who's still awake and wants to ask, ask questions back to you I hope